Hello, my name is Vanessa Davila and today I will be presenting on the mind-body problem. In today's lecture, we'll be looking at the mind-body problem, monism and dualism and its subdivisions, localization, phrenology and equipotentiality, and the hard and easy problems. What is the mind-body problem? So the mind-body problem looks at what the mind is and its relationship to the brain. Um, there are several groups that formed to try and answer this mind-body problem, which were monists and dualists. Um, let's talk about monists. So monism, what is monism? Um, monists believe that the mind does not exist, but is rather just a concept that contains various things. But in and of itself, the mind doesn't actually exist. Um, it doesn't actually perform tasks or actions. Um, some neuroscientists believe that the mind is simply a group of tasks that the brain can do, such as thinking, sensing, planning, and feeling. Um, these neuroscientists claim that thinking that we have a mind because we realize the various tasks that the brain can perform is simply an illusion. Um, it's really just an awareness of the brain's actions. Um, also, monists believe that the mind and body are made of the same substance. So the question that monists are asking is how is the physical brain, um, how does the physical brain account for mental processes such as perception and conscious experience? Let's talk about the subdivisions of monism. So we have idealistic monism, which is the belief that everything is a non-physical non mind. Um, we also have materialistic monism, which is the belief that the mind, the body, and everything else is physical. Um, and many monists fit within this category. There's also emergent monism, which personally I do agree with. Um, it's the idea that our experiences and other phenomena come from a perceiver, such as myself, and an object being perceived, such as this webcam, right? Um, also, we can no longer simply look at the mind and the brain, but we have to consider the flesh within this mon monism. Um, and the reason for this is because there was an example done with pianists. Pianists were asked to imagine playing the piano and brain scans were taken of their brain. And then they were asked to actually play the piano and brain scans were taken of their brain playing the piano. They wanted to see if they could look at just these brain images and decipher um, between the actions that that person was performing based on these images. But interestingly enough, the exact same regions of the brain lit up in both scenarios, meaning that they couldn't decipher between physically with the environment what the person's body was doing, um, whether they were imagining or whether they were actually playing, they couldn't decipher just with the images. So that's why they stress the importance of flesh considering the body's interaction with the environment, right? And so there's also a study that was done with people who hallucinated and people who did not, and they saw images instead. So they looked at the brain scans of both scenarios with the hallucinators and non-hallucinators but seeing an actual object in front of them and it came out exactly the same. The same exact regions of the brain lit up. So they had to look at the tasks that these people were doing with their bodies, the flesh, right? Okay, so now we're going to talk about reductive monism, which is the belief that conscious phenomena is nothing more or less than the neural level. Um, reductive monists believe that the hard problem can be solved through a combination of easy problems. So localization. Localization is the idea that different parts of the brain control specific functions. So localization strengthened monis monists' beliefs because it showed that language, emotion, motor control, and more were all uh, controlled by specific regions of the brain, which meant that the mind was no longer an explanation, but rather it was an occurrence of the brain. So let's talk about some real life examples of localization. We have Dr. Sa Dr. P and Sachs. So Dr. P is a mus musical teacher um, in the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and he has agnosia, and he's being interviewed by Sachs. And 
If you want to know what agnosia is, agnosia is a condition that hinders a person from recognizing or comprehending objects and nature in the world due to a brain injury or a disorder to the parietal, temporal, or occipital lobes. Um, these areas of the brain are responsible for memories. So in order to identify familiar objects, people, and sounds, this is what the regions of those brains control. Um, in Dr. P's case, he was able to hear um, and he actually listened to music in order to keep him tethered and connected with reality versus when he would see things, see people that supposedly knew him, he couldn't recognize them and he didn't know who they were or what they were. So that disconnected him from reality. Um, so a great example of this is after an interview with Sachs, Dr. P went to get his hat and reaching for his hat, he actually grabbed his wife's head, but he didn't realize it was his wife's head. He thought it was his hat. Um, also, when Dr. P was walking down the street, he thought parking meters were children and he would tap the parking meters on the top thinking it was children's heads. So the cure, oh, sorry, the cure for, um, not really a cure, but a way to live with this agnosia, Sachs prescribed Dr. P with a life full of music. Um, so we also have Phineas Gage is another great example of localization because in 1848, he had an iron rod drive through his frontal lobes and his skull after a dynamite explosion. And he did survive with little effect to his intelligence, speech, excuse me, movement and memory. However, he became profane. He, um, couldn't conform the social conventions and he was reckless. So also in 1861, there was a French doctor by the name Paul Broca, and he performed an autopsy on a man who had passed away from a stroke because he wanted to see what area of the brain was affected. And he came to find that the Broca's area on the left side of the brain was what caused his fatality. So a warning from Sachs that I thought was very important to mention is the idea of judgment. So judgment is almost never discussed in neurology and psychology, and yet judgment is extremely vital. As Sachs says, judgment is the first faculty of higher life that is ignored by classical neurology. And Sachs says that the mental processes are not simply just abstract and mechanical, personal like judging and feeling without these personal aspects and mental processes we become robotic like dr p a great example of this is dr p being given a glove to try and identify in which he was unable to he couldn't make a cognitive judgment as to its purpose or what it is but only a hypothesis of its functions um, and an observation of its traits right so judgment is intuitive it's personal and it's comprehensive and concrete and we usually use our sense of sight in order to see how things stand out from one another. Dr. P is a great demonstration of what happens to science when it ignores personal judgment and simply only focuses on abstract and computational, meaning that it is vital for judgment to be considered uh, when discussing the mind and the body. Let's talk about Aristotle's four causes. So there's material, efficient, formal, and telic causes. And why does this relate to what we're talking about? Well, material cause looks at what material something is made of, for example, the brain, or for example, materials that consciousness is made up of. There's also efficient cause, how something comes to be, how does it come about? It could be an actor, a structure, an inner connection, like the brain. So formal cause is the actual shape or form that something has. How does consciousness look or come about is a great question to ask. There's tell it cause, the ultimate purpose, why does it exist? why does consciousness exist? So lots of times we see material and efficient causes are answered by neuroscience and classical psychology. However, telic and formal causes are neglected. Okay, we see that in the formal and final causes um, are used to look at Dr. P. There's also ideas that emerge from localization, such as phrenology. Um, which was termed by German anatomists in the 18th century known as Franz Joseph Gall. Phrenology was the idea that there are 35 different divisions on someone's school, which represent various emotions and intellect that someone has. And in order to determine what someone's characteristics are and what their intellect are, you must feel for bumps on the skull of 
people's heads. And that determines what traits that person possesses. This was a very extremist type of view, as well as this next extremist type of view, which is called equipotentiality, which was formed by Carl Florenz in 1929. Um, in which he believed that there were no subdivisions and no certain areas of the brain that served specific functions, but rather the entire brain for, uh, formed similar functions. They performed the same things. So he believed that if you had a brain injury, it didn't matter where on the brain you had the injury, but rather the amount or the degree of damage to the brain um, in order to determine the function that was lost. So what do we believe today? We believe a median between these two extreme views. Um, and that's because we have seen that different areas of the brain do control certain functions, right? And that's known as localization. However, we also see that the amount and the degree of damage in a brain injury is also extremely vital because if it's more severe, that causes a more severe loss of function. We also have dualism, which is the opposite of mon monism, um, and it's the belief that the mind and brain are separate. So many dualists believe that the body is material and the mind is non-material. Dualists also believe that the mind influences behaviors by interacting with the brain. Dualists seek to answer the question of how a non-physical mind impacts a physical body. We're going to talk about the easy and hard problems now. So the easy problem is only concerned with a specific mechanism that explains how the brain functions and performs. A great example of this would be wondering and figuring out how the brain integrates information. It's the easy problem because there's an easy uh, solution for it. There's an easy way to figure this out. And it's something that neurology can easily um, discover and show people. However, the hard problem is something more intricate. It was coined by David Chalmers in 1944, where the hard problem is really concerned with why are we conscious at all? And why and how do we experience things? We want to know that after performing a certain task, why is experience a certain experience accompanied by a certain task rather than a different experience, right? So an example of this would be if we have a paper cut, we experience pain. It's a very certain experience. However, it's not the same experience we experience when we have an itch. That's a very different experience, right? So we want to figure out why that is, what causes that. So both the easy and hard problems try to dive deeper into our understanding of what the relationship is with the mind and the brain um, and looking at the functions that the brain performs and how, as well as trying to grasp how and what causes our abilities to be conscious, right? That's what we're trying to get at with the easy and hard problems. Um, we also see in a TED talk with Chalmers, he looks at possible explanations to this hard problem, which are extremist views, right? But he says it's possibly that consciousness is fundamental. It's possibly that consciousness is universal, or even perhaps it is through the linking of physical information processing that consciousness can be answered. He doesn't know for sure, but he does say that he believes that there is a possibility of finding out the answer to the hard problem in the future. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you really enjoyed this. Have a great day.